It has been said that every person has a book within them, the story of their life, the events that shaped them, the passions that moved them, the people that influenced them, the moments that impacted them, even the faith that transformed them. And through these stories flows joy and sorrows, disappointments and delights, countless twists and turns, all interwoven to create a never-before-told, one-of-a-kind story. The story of you. It's a story still being written by you and by God, day after day, line after line, storylines, write good things. You might find those words familiar because they're the opening lines of the story that we know as the prince and the pauper. And Edward Tudor was the king. He was born to be the king, the prince of Wales, and we've heard a lot about that lately. And Prom Canty, he was just a poor boy born to a beggar family, and that was just one more mouth to feed. And it became you know, joy on one side and sadness on the other side, but the boys grew up in England, and one day they went out. And they ran into each other, and they discovered that they looked just like each other, and so they traded places. And this is a story that uh, Mark Twain was the actual one who wrote this. Uh, Many years ago, he was not a Londoner, he was an American, and usually the boys that he wrote about were Tom and Huck, not Tom and Edward. But he wrote this story uh, uh, that was called The Prince and the Pauper, and it was a story of mistaken identity. Or it was a story that we could say of an imposter. Or we could say it was a story of just confusion. But you see, that's a story that we can identify with as well. Because in our stories, there's the story that we think is true. And then there's the story that might happen to be true. There's the story that everyone thinks that you are. And then there's the story of what you really are. We could say it this way. There's the you that you want people to believe that you are. And then there's the you that really people know that you are. And there's the you that you're embarrassed by and that sometimes you try to hide. And there's the you that you think that nobody knows about. And there's also the you that you would like to be, but that's definitely not you. And there's all these yous that are running around in your story. But the question this morning is, which one is the real you? Well, the answer is maybe it's all of the above, and maybe it's none of the above. And so the question that we want to explore today as we look at the story of you is, who are you, really? And are you who you think you are? And are you who you think you should be? And what do you do with all of this confusion that we deal with? All of the versions of ourselves that are out there, how can we make them more consistent with each other? Or how can we find our true self? And so that's the question that we're dealing with here this morning. We're going to be looking in Romans chapter 8 and want to give you a chance to get there. But I want to go back before we go any further and just review where we've been as we've talked about this Story of You series. We started in week one and we talked about your story and we compared it actually to a ball like this. 
And we talked about um, how the ball actually, it, the, our story is not a chronological timeline. It's actually the story of our existence. It's everything that's happened to us on the outside. It's everything that's going on inside us. And it's how we kind of bounce through life. That's our story. And it's how we respond to different things. It's how we process different things. And it's even the message that we give out. That is the story. But it's how we take the elements of who God's made us to be and the elements of how things have happened in our lives in how it frames us, in how we see life, and how we respond to life. So a couple of weeks ago, Mark talked about this, about how God makes and crafts us. And we're all made individually, and we're all crafted and woven together. And, and really, God is the artist, makes us these people, unlike anybody else, and just with incredible gifts and abilities and personalities and attributes and possibilities. And he talked about all these positive ways that God makes us. Because we have a role in the big story, too, and so we've been created to, to play that role in the big story. I also noticed in going back and, and, uh, and reviewing Mark's message that he had to go down the grandparent path again. Have you noticed that? And, and two weeks ago, again, it was like, why we can have now seven grandkids now with one, another one on the way there. There is an answer for that. Some of us just aren't old enough to have that many grandkids, Okay. Well, two weeks ago, or last week rather, we talked about the idea of, from the life of Joseph, of all of the moments and the events that happened to us, and a lot of times it can even be negative, but we take them in and we process them, and it becomes how we respond to things that are going on there. So there's these things that are happening to us externally, but they impact us internally. And so something in our lives comes up, and, and it's, maybe it's a trauma. It could actually even be a good thing. But it hits us on the outside, but we take all of these outside influences, and we start to process them, think about them, dwell on them on the inside. And one of the challenges in, in, in writing a good story is that we learn to... That's going. That's okay. I don't need it. It can, it can, it can, it can, it can stay there. Okay, do not throw that at anybody, Okay. So, yeah. But we have these stories that, that, that we're um, talking about, but what's true in these stories is they're constantly in flux. They're constantly evolving, changing. We're growing, hopefully. Uh, we're seeing things differently. We're developing. We're morphing. And so when we talk about this question of who you are, it's not just a question of who you are right now, it's a question of who you've been, but it's also a question of who you are becoming, who you are trying to be, who you are supposed to be, because with all of these yous that we're talking about, what's probably true for most of us is we aren't the you that we want to be. And I'm not the me that I want to be, at least not yet. And so we get caught in this tension of pretending to be something that we're not, whether it's in front of others or just in our own minds, rather than really focusing on who are we trying to become. And the whole thing gets really confusing as far as who I am. But it's not just me that has that problem. It's you that has this problem. And it's actually the Apostle Paul that has this problem. And that's why we're looking at Romans chapter 7. So if you've got your Bibles or your devices, whatever you're using here this morning, Let's look at Romans chapter 7, and we're going to dive in at verse number 14, and it says this, We know that the law is spiritual, but I am unspiritual, sold as a slave to sin. And so this is Paul speaking, probably the greatest Christian of the New Testament. And what does he say? He says, um, I'm not very spiritual, I'm actually a slave to sin. But he lays out this idea of sin, and he says, for me, Paul, even though I've been changed by Jesus Christ, sin is still a part of my story, and it's a factor that's contributing to who I am. And I love his honesty and his vulnerability here, and he's basically saying, hey, I, I struggle. In fact, he goes on, he says, I don't understand what I do. I don't get it. I'm frustrated. I'm confused. For what I want to do, I, I, I don't do. And what I hate, I do. In other words, this is who I think I am, and this is who I want to be, 
and this is how I act. But when I look at how I act, it actually tells me I'm a liar because it's not who I think I am and it's not who I want to be. And I'm frustrated by this and I'm confused by this because I guess I'm not really who I think I am and I'm definitely not who I think I want to be. And he goes on there in verse number 16, he says, and if I do what I don't want to do, I agree that the law is good. And if I, and, and let me try that one again. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. And as it is, it is no longer I who do it, but it is sin living in me. It's not the law that's the problem. It's me that's the problem, and sin is the problem. He goes on there, he says, For I know that good itself does not dwell in me, that is, in my sinful nature. And so what he actually does is he, in, he introduces another element of something that makes us who we are. And so we could take from two weeks ago, God creates us with all of these gifts, abilities, potentials, all of these passions that are in us, and that's part of who, what makes us who we are. And then we talked about last week about all of these different events and, and situations and experiences that we have in the environments that we grew up in, and that's part of what makes us who we are. And then Paul adds something else in here. He says, in my sinful nature, and that's part of what makes us who we are. And I can get excited about the first thing, and I can live with the second thing because that's not me. It's kind of outside of me. It just affects me. But when I get to this third one, it's a little bit more sobering and a little more humiliating there. But God crafts us to be who we are. We are who we are in response to environments, but we also are who we are because we've been impacted by sin. And Paul goes on here. He says, for I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For I do not do the good that I want to do, but the evil that I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want to do, it's no longer I who do it, but it's sin that's living in me. Paul's saying there's two versions of me. There's like this spiritual version of me that really wants to love God, please God, obey God, serve God. That's the version that's been saved from sin's penalty, that's been saved from sin's power, but Paul says there's this other version of me where I just keep messing up. I keep doing what I don't supposed to, I'm not supposed to do, and the truth of the matter is sin's still a part of my story. And I'm still struggling with it. So he goes on here and he says, so I find this law. And when he says law here, he's not referring to the, the law of the Bible. He's just f- referring to, here's like this rule or here's this fact that I find to be true in my life. So I, here's what I find that's at work in my life. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For my inner being, I delight in God's word. But then I see this other rule or law or driving force at work in me. Waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. And so what he's saying here is part of me wants to do what's right, and part of me still does what's wrong. And somehow, though, this is at the core of who I am. And this is part of my story, and he says this in, in like summary or conclusion or frustration, whatever you want to say. Verse number 24, he says, what a wretched man I am, because... I am constantly dealing with this tension that there's this me that I'm supposed to be and there's this me that I am and they don't match up very well here. And so he goes on and he says, who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? Somebody please help me. Can you relate to the struggle? Where you're like, this is who I'm supposed to be, and then I look at who I am, and they just do not match up. For instance, I want to be an honest person, and then I find myself telling another lie, or, or I want to be a trusting person, and yet I find myself worrying, or I want to be a loyal friend, and I find myself gossiping. Or I want to be disciplined, and I find myself still lying in bed, and it's noon. Or I want to be pure, and I find myself looking at this thing on the screen that I shouldn't be looking at. And we have all these things of here's who I want to be, and here's what I actually do. And this incongruency starts to drive us crazy. It's not just Paul, is it? It's all of us. And I love what he says here. He says, can anybody rescue me? Verse number 25, thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. And Paul says, there's good news here because there is a rescuer who can rescue me from me. And you can take my story and make it what it should be. So in this passage, 
Paul struggles or shares the struggle as he wrestles with these various versions of himself. And in the process, he provides some really helpful insights for us as we struggle with the same thing. So let's just think about some things that show up in the story here. First of all, we see the objective. And the objective is this. The objective is harmony. And what happens in our stories is we have this me that I want everybody to think I am. And I have this me that really is what people see. And I have this re- me that is what I actually do. And they have this me that I'm like, oh, well, this is what I should have done. And I have this me that I'd like to be. And I have all of these different me's going on here. But the goal here is to bring these all together until we have just like one me or all these different layers of me all lined up together so that that there's congruency here. Because when these things get out of whack here, we sense the tension inside of us. And that's the frustration. Have you ever said this? I can't believe I did that. That's just not me. Well, the truth is, it is you. But what you wanted to do that was, would have been the right thing is part of you too. And so we just kind of like, I'm mad at myself. And, and, and we start to feel that uh, inner tension that's going on there because we don't have these things lined up. And so what we're looking for is we're looking for harmony in our lives where these versions line up where who I think I am is really who I am. And actually who you think I am is who I am. And who I want to be is who I am. And who God wants me to be is who I am. And it creates congruency, consistency, and some inner peace. But the harmony that we're talking about is not just about you being consistent with yourself or with who you are. It's that you be consistent with who God made you to be and who God wants you to be. And so sometimes they're like, well, I'm just going to be my real self. I'm going to be true to myself. That's not the goal. The goal is not to be the real you or to be true to yourself. The goal is to be the you that God wants you to be and that he made you to be. And so the objective here, it's not just so that I, you know, don't act like a hypocrite. I'm just like, well, yeah, okay, that's just who I am. I'm just acting like it. The goal is that we actually become who God wants us to be. So how do we get there? Well, the approach or the attitude that we're going to need shows up and is demonstrated by Paul here in humility. The attitude or the approach needs to be humility. It's where we get to the place where we say, you know what? I got some work to do here. You know what? I'm not all that. You know what? I'm not like who I am supposed to be. And what I love about this passage is who's the great demonstration of humility in this passage? Paul. Paul's writing to all these people like, hey, here I am, you know, the one that you all look up to. Uh, Just so you know, I got some big problems going on too. And there's a certain humility that Paul demonstrates here to say, you know what, this is maybe your problem, but this is my problem too. So let's just get it out here on the table and let's talk about it. Because pride is one of the greatest obstacles that keeps us from identifying our true selves. And I'm not talking about the pride where I feel good about myself. What I'm talking about is I'm talking about the pride where I don't want to feel bad about myself. So I don't want to be exposed. I don't want to be embarrassed. I don't want you to think like, oh. So I, I'm always like trying to make sure that you don't actually see the real me because that wouldn't be a pretty thing for you to see. And I would feel bad about that. And we have to come to the place if we're going to be... Um, consistent with ourselves, we're like, okay, the object here is not to protect my image. The object here is not so everybody thinks good about me. The object here is simply to say, okay, it doesn't really matter what anybody thinks. I just have to get to the root and to the core of this and to address some of these issues. And so we need to take an attitude that says it doesn't matter what the image is, what the opinion is, but what matters is what God thinks what matters is really what's going on here in my lives, in my life. And that's when we start to find our true selves. And again, my true self is not my real self. My true self is my authentic self. And the difference between those real is who I am actually, and authentic is who God wants me to be. So what's the pathway to get there? Well, one of the pathways to get there is honesty. And one of the things I love about this passage here is how honest Paul is with his struggles But one of the things that we wrestle with so much when it comes to these versions of ourselves is the fact that we're not particularly honest. And let me just mention some things here. 
And they'll show up on your screen. They're not actually in your notes. But we struggle with honesty when we tell ourselves that we are okay. Sometimes we look at our stories and say, you know, I'm okay. Even though we really aren't. And sometimes that's just simply because of a lack of self-awareness. Yeah, I'm fine, but I don't really know what's going on inside of me. I think of, like the, uh, Peter is a great example of this. Jesus says, hey, Peter, you're going to deny me three times. Oh, I would never do that. What was Peter's heart? Well, he was behind Jesus 100%, right? But what was the reality? There were some problems going on inside Peter. Pride wouldn't be one of them. And he was totally unaware of what was actually his story, who he was. And he has some significant blind spots. And we get there too because sometimes we're just not aware of what the issue is. And sometimes this is a lie we tell ourselves that we're okay because we just don't want to go there. If I tell myself I'm not okay, then I have to start digging out some of this junk that's present in my life, and that's going to be painful. And I'm not sure I want to wrestle with it. I'm not sure that I want to mess with that. So I'm just going to walk away from that. And so it's easier to excuse myself than it is for me to dig up the self and to feel bad about myself. So I just tell myself, hey, you know what? I'm okay. Or I'm better than that person. Yeah. So I must be fine. We tell ourselves, secondly, that it's just the way that we are. You ever say that, well, you know what, I shouldn't be that way, but it's just the way that I am. And we confuse something here. We confuse inherent weakness, which, by the way, I don't know that Mark mentioned this, but it goes part of the story here. When God creates us, we're created with limitations, and we actually have weaknesses, which force us to God, which force us into relationships with other people. And there's nothing sinful about those. But we also have things that are part of our stories that aren't weaknesses. They're just called sins. And we are responsible for those things. You know, sometimes we're like, well, I'm just a negative person. No, you're not being honest with yourself. You say, I'm just a negative person. No, you're being sinful and you're being so negative. Or, well, you know what, I'm, I'm just a worrier. No, you're doing something you shouldn't be doing. You're letting sin have a part of your life. Or, you know, I'm just kind of impatient. And I get nailed on that one. Uh, I, was, I was not amused, but I was interested to note when we were doing our latest session of re-engage, which we started last Wednesday night. The first lesson is always on love. And we look through 1 Corinthians chapter 13, and we look at all those characteristics of love that Paul lays out there. And it's like, okay, which one of those do you really struggle? And Kelly and I have been through this six times. And uh, so I always do the workbook along with everybody else, and so I get to that, I'm like, okay, which of these ones do I really struggle with? And I'm like, uh, you know, love is patient, you know, and, uh, and, and the whole idea of impatience, and I'm like, oh, that's my struggle. And then I realized that's what I wrote in session five, in session four, in session three, in session two, and in session one. Like, maybe it's time for me to work on my impatience, right? Well, I'm just an impatient person. No, no, no. I have a sin problem that's reflected in my impatience. And so we tell ourselves that that's just the way that we are because we make attempts and we fail in our attempts to be different. So we just give up and say, well, just resign ourselves to that. All right. That may be who you are, but that's not who God wants you to be. Thirdly, we tell ourselves that nobody else will notice. Really? Really? We think we hide it. We think we cover it up, but it's really not as covered up as we think that it is. Sometimes we tell ourselves that we can, um, or excuse me, that we can't be different and that we can't change. Sometimes we tell ourselves that we can fix ourselves. Now, that's a good one, isn't it? We tell ourselves that we can fix ourselves. Because then that means that I have this ability to, to do this, and this is what Paul's frustrated about in this passage here he's like i can't i keep trying to fix myself and i can't fix myself and so we tell ourselves that lie and sometimes we tell ourselves that you know um that if we'll just fix the outside that will be okay and so brian has the ball now i don't but we spend a lot of time working on the surface of the ball instead of working on what's going on inside and it's like if i can just fix what's going on in the outside i'll be okay well, that's a lie, too. And we're not very honest with ourselves in these areas. So we need to, if we're going to be the person that God wants us to be, we need to learn to be honest with ourselves. But then secondly, we need what I would call hyper-love. 
And I know that's not really a biblical term. But hyperlove, I was going with the H's, so why not? And this is not in your outline either, but it fits here, okay? Because when Paul says, I need somebody to rescue me, he says, oh, thank goodness there's Jesus. And Jesus is the one who looks and sees the real you and the real me that doesn't fool anybody. And he says, oh, I still love you. I, I love you as you are. You don't have to clean yourself up. You don't have to be better. You don't have to try to put on a face. You don't have to do anything. I just love you for who you are. And I love you enough that I'll help you become who you need to be. But we're just going to start here. And that's extreme love when somebody loves us when we're unlovable. And that's our fear. That's our fear why we're not willing to sometimes be honest. And that's our fear where sometimes we're not willing to let people see what we're struggling with. Because we're afraid that they might not like us or that they may not love us. And Jesus says, you know what, we can just, we can just cut through all of that junk. Because it doesn't matter who you are. I love you in spite of it. And that's what Paul's saying in this moment. He's like, who will rescue me? Well, thank goodness Jesus will because Jesus doesn't care who I am in this moment. And Jesus steps into our story with this, what I would call hyper love. And he loves the real me, but he's in the process of loving the real me. He says, how about if I help you become the authentic me? Or the authentic you, if that's the pro appropriate way to say that. And he helps us move in that direction. And then thirdly, is how do we go about this? It's, the process is the Holy Spirit. We read it in, in verse number one of the next chapter, because he continues on with this thought. He says, therefore, there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. Those who live, in verse number 5, those who live according to the flesh have their mind set on what the, spirit, or the flesh desires. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their mind set on what the Spirit desires. And it introduces, Paul introduces another idea here when we talk about the story of you. It's not just how you're made. It's not just those things that are going on, the environments and the experience you have. It's not just sin. But we also add, for the person who's a follower of Jesus who's accepted Christ, we add the Holy Spirit, and he comes into our lives, and he brings with him hope. And what he does is he brings in the possibility for this life that's not what it should be to line up with this life that is what God wants it to be, and for there to be congruency. We don't have time to talk through all of the ways that the Holy Spirit does this, we did a series back about a year and a half ago called The Inside Guide. If you go back to week two, we looked at the exact, this exact same passage, and we talked about how the Holy Spirit helps us grow in our faith. But the story of you is the story of trying to get all these different versions of you. And to get them to be congruent, but not just so that you're not being a hypocrite and not so that you're hiding from others or, or whatever, but so that you can experience some peace in your life. But you're never going to get that just by being this version of you that's not the right version. But at least I'm not a hypocrite. That's not the point. The point is that, that we identify who Jesus wants us to be, who the Holy Spirit's working to make us be, and we become that person. And we become our authentic selves. We started this morning with the story of the prince and the pauper. And we're not going to get to what's on the rest of your outline. We just don't have time this morning. But the prince and the pauper is a story about mistaken identities. It's a story about appearances, about how people saw them, about who people thought that they were. And maybe even who Tom and Edward, the two boys in the story, wished they could be. But the fact was that they were never going to be those people. Because they couldn't be. They could only be who they were. But our story is better than that. We, in a sense, can only be who we are. But we can be so much more than what we are. We can be who God made us to be and who God wants us to be. You can be somebody else. And that's not putting up a false front. That's saying, you know what? 
this isn't okay, and this is what God wants me to be. And that's where we need to go this morning. So we need to ask ourselves some questions. We need to observe our life and our, and our reactions and our responses because that tells us something about what's going on inside us. We need to be aware of the thoughts that we're having. We need to be aware of, of some of the things that we do. We may need to take some time to do some self-examination and some soul-searching. We, might not even, we may even need to sit down and ask some other people some questions because we often have blind spots. And boy, that's a scary thought, isn't it? To say, hey, could you help me hear anything you're seeing that maybe I need to be aware of? It scares me. But that's part of the process of becoming who you are supposed to be. So the question this morning is, which version of you is the real you? Well, kind of. But the bigger question this morning is, are you the you that God wants you to be? Are you the you that you need to become? Let's pray. So our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. Let me just ask a couple of questions here this morning. First one is, who are you? If you're completely honest with yourself, who are you? How many versions of you are out there? Well, here's who I'm trying to make my friends think I am, or here's who I'm trying to make my parents think I am, or my mate think I am, or the neighbors think I am, or the coworkers think I am, or who are you? Who are you pretending to be? Or have you accepted yourself as you shouldn't be? Here's what I want to encourage you to do. First of all, I want you to, to start by just offering a prayer here to, to God in, in the silence of the moment here. And start by asking him for awareness. And the two words I would use for that are search me. Okay, God. Show me where I'm a phony. Show me where I'm a hypocrite. Show me where I'm just trying to put up appearances. Search me. Will you pray that? And then as God brings things to mind, prayer shifts to forgiveness, and the two words would be, forgive me. Starting point, God. If I'm honest, this is who I am, this is how I've acted, this is what's going on in my life, forgive me. And then thirdly, I would say, change that prayer to a prayer asking for help, and the two words would be, change me. God, we come to you this morning, and we humbly ask that prayer. It takes a lot of humility. We ask you to search us. You know us better than we do, better than we know ourselves, and show us what needs attention. God, forgive us for not being who we should be. And then God, help us. We struggle so much with this. But I pray that even in this week as we go forward and as we take things that you've shown to us, I pray that you would help us to be people that we were created to be. I pray this all. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, would you stand with me this morning? I'm so glad that you're here. If you're using your Storylines notebook, here's your prompt for this week. This is the me that I would like to be, and this is why I would like to become that person. And you don't have to follow these prompts. You can use whatever you want to do. But the challenge is always for us to... Take steps, not just on Sunday, but through the week, to become the person that God wants us to be. All right, storylines, write good things. You're dismissed.